And our next speaker this morning uh, is Vice President of News at Google. He guides Google's strategy in how it surfaces news on Google Search, Google News, and its smart devices. Uh, that's not an easy job, as you might imagine. And uh, we've asked him here to talk a little bit about media and democracy in a divided society. Uh, Richard is no newcomer to the media and news world. Uh, in March 2018, he announced the Google News Initiative, uh, and he helped found Salon.com. He's worked with a wide number of organizations about freedom of speech and media policy and so on. So please welcome the VP of News at Google, Richard Jingris. Hi, Richard. Good morning, Alistair. Great to be here. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I know it's it's sad that uh, Sue, your counterpart, wasn't able to be here for this conversation, but I'm sure you'll do admirably. Uh, we've obviously been going through a lot of the questions around how we know what true is and what the world of media looks like when everybody has their own personal news feed. Uh, one of the things I was staggered by in uh, the previous talk was that in the last two years, Facebook has blocked 3.5 billion accounts that were fake accounts. I believe that was the number. That's more than they actually have real accounts. There's an algorithmic asymmetry that we have to grapple with here, I think, um, where you can create fake accounts faster than human accounts. And with the advent of things like GPT-3 and the sort of arms race around generative adversarial networks, that uh, algorithmic arms race seems like it's going to get harder to deal with. Um, how do we work on the underlying incentives to tackle the problem of uh, algorithmic falsehood in the media and in news? Well, obviously there are several uh, complex questions there. Um, I, I think, as you note, we are seeing an increase in the sophistication um, and frequency of synthetic media, of fake uh, content. Um, I think as much as we will uh, continue to develop efforts to identify uh, that material, I think we also should presume that there will be synthetic media that we cannot detect, certainly not in real time. And that, therefore, I think shifts the landscape. Uh, so from my perspective, with the algorithms that we operate, uh, you know, first and foremost is let's look deep at where the content is coming from, right? Who is publishing this material? Who is recommending this material? Who's sharing this material, right? So you know, in, in a sense, take a step back and look at the level of, look at the reputation behind those that are sharing this material, uh, make sure that they were surfacing uh, content that's coming, emanating from authoritative sources. Uh, that's step one. But I think also in all of our algorithms is to take great care uh, to, to, to really achieve two things. And sometimes they're at, at friction. With Google search, for instance, our job is to help you find anything that's findable in the corpus of legal expression, even if that content is heinous, right? So we will do that. We will let you find that material. The balance is how do we allow you to find material yet do not uh, amplify material in an ill-considered fashion? I think these are the kinds of questions that any platform should be considering. It's certainly what we consider uh, with regard to Google search and, and our various news and information products. So um, I, I know you have some remarks that you wanted to share with us on how journalism and political leaders and tech platforms might address some of these challenges. And then when you come back, I'll have questions from me and maybe some from the chat as well. Certainly. Great. Thank you. Uh, in 1994, the World Wide Web had fewer than 3,000 websites. Uh, today, we have more than 2 billion, an explosion of expression beyond which the world has ever seen or could have fully imagined. Simply put, the, inter the, the internet has put a printing press in everyone's hands. Everyone has the opportunity to share their voice in the public square and beyond the public square. It did indeed change how we communicate, how we learn, how we shop, how we sell. It changed how we are informed of the issues of the day, how we form opinions about the issues of the day, how we develop our perceptions of the world around us and of each other. It has never been easier, on the one hand, for small or less voices to speak. Maybe they're on the other side of the world, maybe they're right next door. It has never been easier for political and civic organizations to communicate, coordinate, mobilize, often benefiting voices that were perhaps left aside by existing political organizations. It has never been easier for people to find health information, 
for farmers to find market information, for young and old to learn new skills. The internet exponentially expanded both the marketplace for information and the marketplace for ideas. It has brought extraordinary value to our societies. Yes, the internet can elevate noble speech, that which appeals to our better angels, but as we now well know, it can also enable harmful speech, from outright disinformation to the exponential amount of opinion pieces that misrepresent facts and context. It has introduced disruptive challenges to our institutions, to the media ecosystem, and to the world of politics and public policy. Yes, the internet and real-time communications has given the political class the ability to circumvent the press and play to their constituencies or their bases in real time. And yes, that appears to have a rather deleterious effect on a representative, deliberative democracies. The question is, can we find a path back to objective truth and a pursuit of consensus via thoughtful deliberation? Or do we slide downhill into alternate realities or what C. Wright Mills might have considered the tyranny of the majority? Existentially, it poses the paradoxical question, how can democracies survive and thrive in environments of unfettered free expression? As we are all aware, misinformation and disinformation are as old as civilization itself. Ask Plato. It didn't begin with the internet. It is not isolated to any particular ideology. But the internet has expanded the means of free expression and the amplification of that expression. And it has presented each and every one of us with the means to find the, inf the affirmation we prefer versus the information we require. Several years back, Google helped enable the global ecosystem of fact-checking organizations, a noble effort with positive effects, but it too runs into our human biases. We tend to think of our species as being capable of pure reason, capable of analyzing an abstract concept and coming to a reasoned conclusion. But the fact is human reason operates within social constructs. We are all predisposed to align our thinking within the social circles we are attached to. It's a survival skill. If the head of the tribe says the moon is green, we'll say, yes, indeed it is, for fear we might not get a leg of the calf at dinner that night. All of us now have a responsibility to rethink how we address these challenges. There are no simple answers. Indeed, the solutions often proposed are rife with secondary consequences on our societies and on the nature of free expression itself. We might think twice before we ask a social network or a search engine to decide what is or is not acceptable free expression. I do not say that to suggest that Google can lean on free expression and say it's not our problem. We do recognize that freedom of speech does not guarantee freedom of reach, particularly when the provenance of the content is unknown or unaccountable. That is on us. Free expression, yes. Ill-considered amplification, no. In 2018, I spent a year as a member of the Knight Commission on Trust, Media, and Democracy. Over the course of those many meetings and deliberations, I came upon a poignant question it captures the challenge quite well. Free expression in the United States, as you might know, is codified by the First Amendment of the US Constitution. The right to bear arms is codified by the Second Amendment. The poignant question is this, is the internet to the First Amendment what the AK-47 is to the Second Amendment? Let me repeat that. Is the internet to the First Amendment what the AK-47 is to the Second? Our societies may be ruled by laws, but the health of our societies is guided by our norms. Our societies are only as good as we are as individuals. Our societies are only as good as our leaders guide us to become. Our societies are only as good as our ability to listen more than we talk. Only as good as we are willing to listen beyond our tribal echo chambers only as good as we are able to engage constructively 
and with empathy. All of us need to explore new methods of helping our citizens obtain fact-based information about the state of their world to help them be better informed about which issues are important and which are not. At Google, I helped initiate a project called Common Knowledge, which just launched in the United States. Common Knowledge is a vast open resource of statistical data, largely from government sources, to help our users and help journalists provide a more data-driven context around the issues of the day. Can we give our communities a weather report of key metrics beyond the whether we need a raincoat? What is the crime rate and how has it changed? The graduation rate, the air quality index, all the important measures that truly define the comfort of our communities and might better help us understand which issues are truly problematic and deserve the attention of our voters. Why are the voters of St. Louis or Saskatoon going to the polls with fears of terrorism or immigration when the important concern might be the state of the local schools or the use of pesticides on our crops. But none of the solutions we envision will be effective without institutions and leaders who set the proper norms that guide the health of our society. I choose to be optimistic. I trust we all are. I will work to find solutions where technology can help citizens have the tools and information they need to be thoughtful, informed citizens. But the challenges we face will require the leadership of many, not the leadership of one, to rethink our institutions and the fact-based knowledge that allows them to be effective, to help citizens assess what they consume, to separate fact from fiction, wisdom from spin, and to provide the role models and the norms that can guide the health of our societies beyond the legal constructs our open size societies live within. I thank you very much for listening and look forward to further discussion. Wow. Uh, that was, I, I got so many sound bites out of that. Um, really good points. Uh, I think we have now gotten to the point where we understand that access to information is not necessarily the right to amplification. Um, and that's a wonderful place to start this from. Uh, I'm a huge fan of Jonathan Haidt's writing on the in the Righteous Mind about moral reasoning, and as you said, you know, not criticizing falsehood because we crave approval much more than uh, being right. Um, can you tell me how we change that level of like jungle surplus wetware wiring uh, technology? You know, Daniel Kahneman famously said we should just get machines to make all the decisions because humans are consistently wrong. The estimates and software delivery vary by 60 or 70%. The estimates, most of, even experts who say they follow their own processes are consistently not doing so, not following best practices, driven by their own internal sort of um, goals and, and avarice. If even the experts are unable to follow their own advice, um, Kahneman suggests that a machine would be much better at making decisions because it would follow the actual facts. What are your thoughts on how technology can augment us so we become more rational if our jungle surplus wetware is unable to be rational? Well, several things. I mean, I do think we can make progress to the extent technology can actually demonstrate uh, that it has the ability to uh, to, to make these smart, intelligent steps forward in terms of helping us understand the world around us. Now, as I mentioned, I mean, the Common Knowledge Project is, you know, you could say it's very basic. Uh, uh, but on the other hand, again, how do we give citizens, how do we give journalists the tools they need to provide context about stories, right? I remember a few years ago when there was the attack on the British Parliament, and I, was, I, I made a point of, of watching the media environment over those next few days. And our cable news networks went wall to wall with the coverage for three days. Four people died, it was a sad event. But the pictures are dramatic and they kept playing it over and over again. Interestingly, on three of those days in the United States, there were mass murders of four or more people that did not get covered. So where's our sense of context to give people the guidance they need to go to the polls? So technology, access to information can help. But ultimately, I don't think any of this matters if we don't have leaders who guide our societies in proper ways. 
right? Yes, you could turn it over to machines, but how are you going to get our leaders comfortable doing that? And obviously there are dangers in that as well. So it really does come down to the problem we're facing. The problems we're facing are inherent in our human species. And they will only be solved to the extent that our human species can rise above it as individuals, as leaders, as heads of institutions. And hopefully we can guide ourselves in the right direction. Uh, I opened the conference last year with the line that perhaps the great battle in humanity and perhaps in the universe is the battle between individualism and collectivism that um, we fear what we give up when we become part of the collective. You can see this in science fiction. The Borg is a horrible thing. At the same time, if we cannot take collective action, we can't fix the wicked problems we face like climate change or social justice or other issues like that. Um, and it seems like democracy and society and government is supposed to be how we fix that. But uh, it was all predicated on atomic rules that information is, um, you know, there's one version of the truth that it's hard to make copies of things, that personalization is difficult. It really seems to me like the economics of digital have not properly been internalized by institutions such as free markets, such as governments. Are you hopeful that that will happen or is it going to take a civil war? I'm hopeful it will happen, uh, but you hit on a core point. Uh, you know, how do we how do we respond less as individuals and more with a sense of the collective good? I mean, frankly, I think we've lost a sense of the common good over the years. And frankly, I, you know, I'd be less than honest if I didn't say the Internet had a large part to do with that. Right. The Internet is what I consider to be intrinsically mathematically divisive. Right? because it has allowed us to each find our own channels of information and allowed people of all thoughts and beliefs, heinous and not, to project those beliefs. So and personalization is a bug, not a well, feature. Personalization is a bug, not a feature. You know, there, and that's always to us, that's a big challenge for us is, you know, when do we personalize and when do we not personalize? We do not personalize, for instance, I mean, in Google search, we don't personalize at all, except to tune the geography if you're looking for a restaurant, for instance. But personalizing information about political beliefs is a dangerous thing, right? You simply reinforce the silos of thought. So that's the great challenge, is how do we break out of those silos of thought and recognize the collective common good? Uh, you know, it, it, we used to live in a world where where our health and well-being was based on the common good because we actually had to interact with each other more directly throughout the day, right? The, the word the commons was a shared grazing space, you know, for, 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 for folks who farmed sheep and goats, right? But now we live in our own silos of belief. We live in our own digital worlds. Right now we're living in the prisons of our homes as a result of this COVID crisis, right? And so we're losing the sense of connections with each other and thus the common good. Although I will say sometimes this connection allows us to uh, be more open with one another. Like I want to know why you have an Oscar with a tutu on in the background and you probably wouldn't have shared that. So do you want to explain the Oscar? <laughs> yes. Well, the Oscar, uh, my father-in-law was a, was a, uh, a, a rather amazing screenwriter. Um, uh, he was blacklisted in the 1950s uh, during the Hollywood uh, witch hunt. His name was Dalton Trumbo. Uh, he wrote films like A Roman Holiday, Johnny Got His Gun, many wonderful films, and was a tremendous voice for free expression. So that's one of his Oscars that uh, uh, that we have here. And, and since it's 2020, we think it's appropriate for it to wear a tutu. That's a good story. Uh, last question, and I have many, so I'm going to ask it even though we're over the clock a little bit. Um, uh, there's been a lot of people asking the question about, you know, will we make it through this? Um, what is your greatest fear or what do you see as the greatest risk to resilient democracy in the next decade? It is truly the question that I raised. How do we manage free expression? And that's a contradiction, right? You know, democracies are based on these core liberties like free expression. Well, there's that great line about no, there's no such thing as a tolerant society because 
any tolerant society must be intolerant of intolerance, which is a paradox, right? Right. Exactly. And that's, you know, one of the things that Plato pointed out is that democracies would fail uh, based on the freedoms that they enable. <laughs> Uh, you know, and so that is the greatest challenge: is how do we manage free expression? Um, you know, and I and here and here too, I tend to think, as in many things, that again, you know, we live in a society ruled by laws. But in truth, the health of our societies is guided by the norms of the men and women who project them, right? And we look at the politics in our country over the last several years, and we recognize the tremendous challenges and difficulty of having leaders who don't project norms that one would consider would be in the interest of the common good, in the interest of bridging the differences between various dimensions of our society. How do we bridge those gaps? How do we build a broad enough, common enough acceptance of commonly accepted facts to even have the debates and discussions we need to have to settle on public policy? We uh, heard from the folks in Estonia that one of the things they do there is they take some of their legislation and make podcasts out of it. So you can listen to podcasts on legislation. And in listening to all the talks this morning from Farhad to Yin to Jamie to you, I'm starting to wonder if we can, everyone talks about code as law, right? That, that the law is embodied in some software, but I'm now thinking of laws as dashboards. So if you were to say, this is the law we've enacted, here are the, the arguments that came in for it. These are the votes we passed. These are the pieces of data we collected to inform this legislation. And then from that moment of legislation, and here's what the legislation says in simple language, here are the consequences. This is the number of arrests made or the number of citations given or whatever, you know, the number of school lunches that delivered. I think that we have the ability not just to have code as law, but to have laws as dashboards where you can go back and see the rationale of how we got here and you can see the future of what the effects are. And then when that rationale changes, people could say, well, that assumption that you have is no longer valid. Therefore, it's time to update the law. And it does feel like there's a hope in making things that transparent, but it is an almost Sisyphean effort for a government to build something like that. It's Sisyphean, but it's not impossible. But it does come at that baseline reassessment of who we are and what do we do as individuals? What do we do as political leaders? What do we do as journalists? Right In the world of journalism, I've been for years saying we need to rethink what journalism is and how it performs and presents itself in our modern world, every dimension of it. How do we engage with the audience? How do we present the content? So on and so forth. You know, to your point specifically, because you raised a very good point, you know, and I've struggled with this because, as I said, we're tribal beings. We don't process information purely through what we might think of as, as assiduous logic. Um, and so when confronted with this, I was having a conversation recently, and frankly, I was not feeling very good about things. And, and what I was guided towards was two things. One was empathy. We need to learn how to listen. Every one of us, by the way, we are all subject to falling to the affirmation of our biases, affirming our biases. We're all there. You can see it in our daily behaviors if you look closely enough. How do we, how do we understand and practice empathy? And secondly, to your point, how do we drive constructive understanding of issues? Right? There's actually a, a, uh, there's a, there's a school of thought that's been emerging around the world in journalism led out of Denmark by a fascinating fellow by the name of Ulrich Hagerup called Constructive Journalism. And the constructive journalism approach says that when you report on anything, you're not just reporting on you know, the, 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 what, what the specific incident, you're going beyond it. It's not just that the bus crashed. You wanna go beyond it with your coverage over time. Why did it crash? What are the options for addressing the problems of that intersection, right? And how do you do that in a fact-based, objectively appropriate fashion to suggest that you're not telling people how to think or not telling people what to think, you're trying to guide them how to think. I think that's part of the rethinking that we need to do in journalism. And right now, I honestly have to say, we're not going in the right direction. You know, one of the negatives of the internet is it has enabled a massive exponential increase in opinion content. Awesome. Well, that's a great place to... Everyone can spin it. 
Uh, that's a great way to great place to stop things. Uh, I wish we had more time, but I think people need bio breaks and lunch. Richard, thank you so much. This was I cannot think of a better person to cap off this morning's conversation. Uh, thank you for the work you're doing. Uh, thank you for putting that Oscar there. It means a lot now that I know what it means. So have a great day. Really appreciate you joining us. Thank you very much, Albert.